I didn't finish chapter 23 on Friday because I didn't want to rush it. I think there's some really interesting stuff at the end of this, which is what I'll do now. And then I'll finish and move into the latter chapters, which I tried to condense. And you'll see now it's a transition from my world to your world. And your world tends to be bigger, right? Medicine, pharmacy, biology, uh, engineering, things tend to get bigger. Molecules get bigger, systems get bigger. I'm happy where I am, right? Little molecules with less than 1,000 molecular weight. You, most of you have to deal with molecules much bigger than that. Well, what we left off with was this picture um, of heterocycles. And the idea of heterocycles, that the word just sounds, you know, it means what it sounds, uh, different cycles with different atoms other than carbon. And a vast majority of pharmaceutical compounds will have a heterocycle in them. You'll see here uh, Nexium and, and uh, Viagra, they both have interesting uh, properties and they both have interesting heterocycles, which are nitrogen based, which is why we put them in this chapter. Uh, you can see at the bottom, most of you will have to go into biochem if you, if you um, have a future in biology. And you'll recognize that imidazole at the bottom is a really useful heterocycle because it is basic and it's aromatic. It's equivalent to pyridine in the sense that the, uh, one of the lone pairs is part of the heterocycle, part of the pi system. The other lone pair is free and we can use that as a base. And you will see histamine and things like it do exactly that. They are basic components. Uh, so what I, let, what I did uh, before I came into class today was to put a little bit extra on the bottom of this slide to make it look a little bit more convincing. We see in heterocyclic chemistry, uh, and again, you could take a year's worth of heterocyclic chemistry just as one sort of course, and you'll find that uh, the, the reactions here are somewhat similar to what you've seen. You see electrophilic aromatic substitution, you see nucleophilic aromatic substitution, you see acid-base chemistry. And the example from the textbook to try and highlight how useful these compounds are is to use pyrrole. And pyrrole is a five-membered ring with six pi electrons. If you have six electrons spread over five atoms, we tend to call that pi excessive. Right? Pi excessive. There are more electrons than you have atoms. And these things, obviously, if they're pi excessive, they have extra electrons, then they're going to be nucleophilic. And we can see here in a reaction at uh, zero degrees C, and that zero degrees C will mean something in a second, that you get a very, very high yield of something called 2 bromopyrrole. And if you go back and look at those structures of those pharmaceuticals, you'll find that an awful lot of them contain these types of structures, so this is useful chemistry to be able to do that. If you could make that molecule, maybe you could make a Grignard reagent. Maybe you could then go and do something different and make some carbon-carbon bonds. But the question is, in terms of chemistry, and the mechanistic background to this, why do you exclusively get the 2-bromo? The N is number 1, this carbon is number 2. Why do I get the 2-bromo and not the 3-bromo? Right? And the answer is fairly straightforward if you understand the ideas behind resonance and the ideas of electrophilic aromatic substitution. We really only have two places to put the bromine. We can put it on carbon 1, which we might put there. We can put it in carbon 2, which we might put there. And we can see here that we exclusively get uh, next to the nitrogen. So why is that the case? Well, what you have to do here is write down the possibilities. And like you do on quizzes and homeworks and on the final, you jot down what you think is happening and you try to get some picture and hopefully it comes out. So I have here the thing from the book in which we show the use of bromine as the electrophile. The pyrrole is a nucleophile, very much like an enamine, and it goes after the bromine. Now, we don't need a catalyst here because the nucleophile is nucleophilic enough, and we need low temperature uh, because this is a pretty reactive system. That produces a carbocation, and that carbocation can be stabilized at different places. You can put the positive charge in a bunch of different places, and you can use the lone pair from the end to help stabilize the, car the carbocation. So that's good. I can see three different resonance structures for that intermediate, and that ultimately, after you lose H+, just like you do in an electrophilic aromatic substitution with benzene, you get the aromatic system back, and you end up with the 2 bromopyrrole. Well, I wrote this out this morning just to show you the opposite, show you why it doesn't go to the 3 position. And in this case now, all I'm doing is the same thing, where I'm pushing electron density from the pyrrole to the bromine, and I'm adding it the 3 carbon instead. The problem is, you don't get as many resonance structures. You do get a couple. You can put the positive charge here next to the N, and you can use the lone pair from the N as part of that system to help stabilize it. But you can't go any further. This double bond over here is not part of that system. It's not in communication with those electrons and that carbocation. So I can only see two resonance possibilities here, and that leads to the other product. So the background to this is very similar to what we've done in the past. You are going through the more stable carbocation. What type of chemistry is that? That's Markovnikov, right? It's a Markovnikov type idea applied to something that's very different looking, this heterocyclic system, but it's the same idea. So very you know, common sense things that hopefully you'll be able to pick up on. Now contrast that with pyridine. Pyridine itself is a molecule that you'll see a lot of in biochem, and it's reduced form and it's positive uh, salt form, the pyridinium salt. It's used as an uh, oxidative reductive couple. Like we would use sodium borohydride or PCC, this material is used as an oxidant and reductant, right? NADH, NAD+, you'll we'll see a lot of that stuff in the future. Uh, pyrimidine, you've probably seen these if you've taken any biology classes. Pyrimidines are found in nucleic acids. 
RNA, DNA. We'll talk about that in the next couple of uh, days. And they obviously have some interest. And so if we're able to make them, we have the possibility of doing medicinal chemistry. And so we have to have ways of activating the cycle. Well, pyridine is the opposite story to pyrrole. Pyridine here is not pi excessive. I'll show you some resonance structures in a second to show you this exact idea. You have six electrons based on six atoms in that cycle. But because you have a more electronegative atom in the nitrogen, the nitrogen tends to pull electrons towards itself. That makes the cycle less nucleophilic because the N is kind of hogging the electron density. And you can see here the, the conditions you have to uh, run this reaction under. 300 degrees C is not trivial. That sounds dangerous. It sounds like not something that not much fun. Uh, the contrast there from zero degrees C with the pyrrole, here it's because this is not nucleophilic. You have to force it to want to react. But you do get an OK yield, not great, of a, a product, which happens to be the three bromo system. So there's one at the nitrogen, there's two, and there's three. And we'll have to argue why it goes to three and not to two and four. And these, again, are simple electronic ideas dependent upon resonance structures, dependent upon where the electron density is, and very similar to the stuff we did earlier in the aromatic chemistry. So I put a little bit more detail onto this slide. If you want to take a picture, go ahead. Um, this is now the explanation for why we get what we might call the meta product. Why does the bromine go exclusively to the three position? And the answer is very similar. Draw some resonance structures, decide where the nucleophilic components are, where the electrophilic components are. And since bromine is behaving as an electrophile, it wants to go to the most nucleophilic place. So I have here some structures. I have here some pictures. There's pyridine. There's the outcome from the previous slide. Here is pyridine itself which arguably is a resonance structure. And then because I have in this system an imine, I have the C double bond N type motif, I can split that to draw something like this. And the N becomes negative, the carbon next to it positive because of the difference in electronegativity. And then I can recognize, OK, if I do that, I have what looks like an allylic system. And so I can do that again. I can start delocalizing this around. I can do it again to get to there. Now, if you want to put all that together into a fast sort of uh, picture that allows you to talk about the electron density in this system, the best thing to do is probably do something like that at the bottom. Draw delta positives on each of the positive carbons. Well, that's a problem. Why? We're asking pyridine to behave as a nucleophile. And if the carbons are positive, they're not very nucleophilic. So it's like the meta idea when we did with benzene. The meta substitution isn't a great process. It's slower than benzene because it's an electron withdrawing group. This is similar. This is slower than benzene because it has the N in there. So this carbon here and the other one across the cycle there, the three carbons, they are the least worst. Right? They are the ones that are the most nucleophilic because they're the least electrophilic. They don't bear any positive charge, and so they have some electron density, and they can be nucleophilic. But with that in mind, there you go. That's very, very high temperature. That's something we want to, wouldn't want to do in the lab. That sounds like an industrial process that we leave to the engineers to devise a clever way of doing it. So there you are, you've got two systems now, two simple heterocyclic systems that typify heterocyclic compounds containing N. This is a massive subject. You can do I, I did about a year of this stuff in grad school, uh, learning these systems. They're all out there because of the medicinal idea and the importance in medicine. Uh, and it's a huge subject. But we've given you two, two samples here to just give you sort of an idea of what's going on there. Now, to finish this off, we've got some ideas about spectroscopy. I'm trying to summarize for the final. I'm trying to get people ready for two weeks today. The final's in here. When does it start? It's a half past 10 start, isn't it? 10.30 kickoff? Goes till 12.30? Yeah. And it'll be on the Monday. I hope to have everything done by the Wednesday, then we can move on. Now, spectroscopy-wise, NH bonds, you've got to worry about the fact that they get hydrogen bond, and you've got to worry about the fact that they're similar to alcohols, and they're a little bit of a nuisance. It's very easy to see them in the IR spectrum. All right? You can definitely see primary means. You can definitely see secondary means. And you can see now for this primary mean, butylamine, that we have two NH stretches in that, in that uh, part of the spectrum up at the top left here. And if you read the background to this, it's not because there are two hydrogens. It's because of the way they can actually do their thing. They can actually bend and stretch. And the argument is they can stretch. I'm going to do this, don't laugh. They can stretch like this in the phase, or they can do this. Yeah? And that's where you get two different lines. I'm not doing it again. One of them is in phase, one of them's out of phase. You get two lines. That tells you you've got an amine. So that's going to work for primary means, it'll work for secondary means, but it's not going to work for tertiary means, because tertiary means don't have hydrogens. Thank you. No hydrogens, no NH signal. So how do you make this work for you? If you wanted to actually tell if you have a tertiary mean, protonate it. React it with an acid, make the salt, make the quaternary ammonium salt, as we see on the right over here, and then you'll see the NH signal. So that's one way to do this. But we also remember that NH signals tend to show up in the NMR spectrum. We go back and look at NMR, there's a bunch of that on the final. Be able to draw them, be able to tell me what the products are uh, from a, an unknown. 
And we can see down at the bottom a fairly simple system in which a, a proton exchanges with a deuterium. So we do this all the time, especially in biochemistry when you want to know something about a peptide or a protein and you want all the NHs to disappear to make the spectrum more simple. You put in some D2O. You put a drop of D2O in. And because the NH bonds are fairly are somewhat acidic and they can exchange between H and D, you get all of the H's swapped out for D's. And what was the point with D? What does D show up in the NMR spectrum? It doesn't. It's blank. So you get rid of those signals. And if you have a spectrum in front of you from the immediate, the, the, the uh, protonated form, and then you have the deuterated form, you can pretty much tell which is which. You can map out which signals belong to which protons. And so don't forget that these things are uh, acidic, and they can show up in spectra. They can be a bit of a nuisance because of where they show. It's kind of a broad range, like hydroxyls. Uh, but we can use them. And the last slide in that, se that section in that chapter is just summarizing that, C13 spectra, proton spectra. From my perspective, you, sh you already know this, but two weeks from today, you'll be tested on this type of stuff again. Uh, go back and look at NMR. If you're not happy with it from last time around, come and get some help. So we're done with that. I'm done with the, um, the bulk of the, ch the semester. All we do now for two weeks is summarize and put it into some context. And... I'm going to show you a whole bunch of slides. I've got about 150 slides between now and next Friday, or a week on Friday. Uh, and it's a, it's a huge amount of material. But I would argue there's no new chemistry. We have done all the chemical reactions you need to worry about for the final. So if you're in 22 and 23 and you're keeping up, you're doing okay with quizzes, the rest of this is just FYI. Other than the fact that these are... I've done it again. There we are. These are examples of how to apply this stuff. So on the final, you'll expect to see molecules that are bigger and more complex, but more realistic. And therefore, your job is to look at these things and say, OK, I know what this stuff is. That looks like a Claisen reaction. It's a Claisen reaction and a big, ugly molecule, but a Claisen reaction is a Claisen reaction. So I'm going to do a Claisen reaction. Yeah? And you know the basic reactions, the basic compounds. You can apply it to a whole bunch of bigger molecules. So what I've done here is I've sort of summarized the, the, the next section. This is a brief overview, a brief introduction to the chemistry of carbohydrates, amino acids and their derivatives, and then lipids. And this is based on biological categorization based on their chemical uh, structures and chemical properties. So this is three chapters worth of stuff. Obviously a lot of it isn't in here, uh, a lot of the stuff I just don't have time for, but also a lot of the stuff is in biochemistry. So if you're taking biochem, you will see this anyway. From my understanding of what biochemists need is functional group ideas. So my job at the moment is to point out important functional groups that you have seen you are familiar with that you'll need to take with you to biochem. And then understand that the biochemical chemistry will be very much the same as the organic chemistry. They're the same idea, so take that with you. So I've, I've got here a collection of pictures of compounds from the latter chapters. I then have one more to do, which is polymers. And we can see here a whole bunch of quite diverse organic structures. Anybody who's in biology or anything biologically related ought to be interested in this stuff. If you're not, you're probably in the wrong field. Right? These are biomolecules. And we, we see now, as organic chemists, a lot of detail. And you'll find as you move into biochemistry, we always get this feedback later on, I miss the detail of organic. I miss the sort of regimented way we go about learning mechanisms and the sort of logical way we put things together. Because in biochemistry, you know, you get that sort of thing, that's like, that's like two minutes of class. And there's a rat. And you're supposed to pick all that stuff up. And it's very difficult to do all the detail. Right? So you've got to transition at some point from my class where it's all detail up to that class in which it's very little mechanistic stuff because you don't have time. You're, it's assumed that you know this stuff. So I will take my time with this, two weeks to finish this off, and hopefully it will transition smoothly from here to the future. So I'm going to start off with carbohydrates. You can see the vast differences here in their structures. Lipids at the top, pretty much all carbon, a little bit of oxygen, minimal functional groups, amino acids, all sorts of functional groups. That's probably the hardest thing in biochem, I would think, is either the amino acids and the carbohydrates. Amino acids, we're going to talk about amide bonds. We're going to talk about functional groups in terms of their acidity or basicity. And then their three-dimensional structures, you put these things together into chains so and make polymers out of them. Bottom right, nucleic acids, RNA, DNA. If you've taken biology, you probably know something about these things already in terms of their use uh, as information carriers. And by, uh, the, the, the one that I'm interested in the most in at the bottom left, carbohydrates, is probably the newest frontier in this world, in, in the biochemical world, because we're now starting to be able to make these things and understand what they do, right? Incredibly important materials in, in things like metastasis and cancer, uh, all sorts of different possibilities in, in antibiotic resistance and things like that. So these compounds now are becoming quite important. 
I'll start off with carbohydrates, and I'll highlight it with the simplest one, or I should argue the most common one, glucose. The problem with carbohydrate chemistry, number one, it's complicated. Number two, there are lots of them. Number three, they're incredibly important. And you will find yourselves getting lost in this stuff if you're not careful and you're not thinking like a chemist. So I have an example here where glucose is existing in four different forms. I've got at the top left something called alpha-D-glucopyranose, and that's the form that you get if you crystallize this stuff. I have a beta-D-glucopyranose, an alpha-D-glucofuranose, and a beta-D-glucofuranose. So all this time I've been trying to get nomenclature going with beta-ketoesters and all that stuff, it gets better, or it gets worse, depending upon your perspective. Glucose is very, very, very complicated. It can form bonds in different ways. It can form bonds to each of these different hydroxyls. And I think we have uh, five different hydroxyls on that molecule, and you can bond to any of them. Over here, likewise, if you change this uh, just to the other orientation, where the hydroxyl is axial here and it's equatorial here, you can bond in different ways. So already you've got maybe 10 or 15 different ways of bonding to one six-membered ring. And then down at the bottom, you can do the same, because you have five-membered rings possible. And the idea with the carbohydrates is that one carbohydrate, if you call it a letter like A, it can bond in 20 different ways. So if you have an amino acid, like I'll show you in a minute, which is one letter, you bond it to something else through one bond, that's very simple. It's A, B, C, D. The problem with carbohydrates is they're kind of three-dimensional and orthogonal. They go off in all sorts of different directions. You can have A bonded to A, A bonded to A prime, A double prime, A triple prime. It can just get very, very, very busy very, very quickly. Your job from my class is to recognize something about their chemistry and something about their properties. So very, first off, what do you reckon? Soluble in water or not? Yes, right? Hydrogen bonding all over the place. They're infinitely soluble in water. So that's useful. In terms of their organic chemistry, uh, if you were to oxidize this material with sodium dichromate, what would happen to this CH2OH group at the top? Become a carboxylic acid. If you were to set this up in some way that you isolated each functional group, and you were to uh, oxidize the four carbon right there with PCC, what type of compound would you get? A ketone, right? And that happens in biology. Going, going from glucose to galactose, it has to go through the four keto sugar. So those processes are, are key. At the bottom, likewise, uh, you don't see an awful lot of glucofuranose in nature, but it's usually the six-membered ring because it's more stable. But again, huge numbers of possibilities for bonding these things together. So I'm now transitioning. On the left is my world. On the right is plastic stuff. Okay? On the right is a cartoon version of what's on the left. And some of you people are happy over here, and some of you are happy over here, and the best place to be is happy between the two of them. There are huge fields emerging now in science, like chemical biology, where people are doing chemistry. Organic chemists are, are learning biology and using organic chemicals to probe cell activity. And then if you can probe, for example, cell surface receptors and work out what's going wrong in a cancer process, you can go after that target. So chemical biology now is a massive subject. Some of you will end up doing that for your, your PhDs, I would think. And here is a slide that I think sort of exemplifies where we are going now. From the small, and this is by no means small, this is a very large, complicated system, but it's an organic system in which I can see structures. I can see fatty acids down here. I can see non-polar material. I can see polar material up here because it's all carbohydrate. And then as a chemist, I start to think in a bigger sense. How will these things aggregate? How will they come together? You know, you think about biology, you get told this is a lipid bilayer, and this is where the pieces come in, and this is where things leave the cell and stuff like that. It's all based on physical organic chemical ideas. If you understand that, biology is much more straightforward. So the blue material at the top is water. It's the extracellular milieu. It's outside the cell. And we have here the red material, which is lipopolysaccharide. And polysaccharide, as you'll see, is carbohydrate. So it should make some sense that the carbohydrate presents itself to the water, because the carbohydrate is water-soluble. There's nothing more complicated there than extraction in a separatory funnel. That's the same idea as putting water in a separatory funnel, adding methylene chloride, and seeing that they separate. Or adding hexane, they separate, right? Like dissolves like, and so they stay away from each other. In this case, the, the hydroxyl groups on the sugars are soluble in water. The water goes after them. They're going to attract each other. But then you've got a problem down here. Think about the situation here where you have these fatty acids, these, li these lipid uh, anchor membrane, th these membrane anchors. Those are all very, very nonpolar. They all want to stay as far away as possible from water. And in fact, that's what they do. They aggregate and they become a membrane. If you ever seen one of the cartoon pictures for this, which I'll show you a little bit later, you can see now that they're lined up next to each other. They're with their friends, basically. Right? They're all the same, and they're all happy because they're all nonpolar. They will not go into the water layer. So you get these self-assemblies uh, to be able to do um, biology. So 
history behind this. This is FYI. You are about to become very uh, used to these structures, fissure depictions again. Carbohydrate chemistry is complicated because there are many of them in different forms. They can form six-membered rings, five-membered rings, and open chain forms. But the elucidation of this stuff was done over 100 years ago. The elucidation of the structure of these compounds was done over 100 years ago by Fisher, hence the Fisher depiction. And in a quite brilliant piece of work that won the 1902 Nobel Prize, he worked out the structure of D-glucose. And he got it right, and he worked out by inference all the other structures, and it's been known ever since. Absolutely remarkable work. They're all related to this guy at the top. This is D-glyceraldehyde. The D here, you might make a note of this for future reference, so you're not seeing it for the first time in biochem. The D, uppercase D, corresponds to the configuration in the Fisher depiction. And the uppercase D, or L, for the other series, is the orientation of the hydroxyl or the functional group at the lowest stereocenter in the Fisher depiction. So the lowest stereocenter in the Fisher depiction of this is the middle carbon. And the hydroxyl group there is pointing to the right. And don't forget, this is not random. On the horizontal, a wedge is coming towards you. On the vertical, a dash is going in. That is a set configuration. So again, it's not the bottom carbon because the bottom carbon is not chiral. This bottom carbon next to that one, the lowest stereocenter on the chain, that hydroxyl is pointing to the right. That is the D configuration, as defined by Fisher. He guessed and he got it right. 50-50, he got lucky. So if you look now, working our way through here, we've got the possibility of building up sugars. We can add to aldehydes, do nucleophilic addition. And the early chemistry here was, was great because it tied everything together. You can go from D-glyceraldehyde to two new sugars by adding an extra group, an extra carbon. And the relationship there now to give D-erythros and D-3Os was explaining the fact that that carbon that you start with on D-glyceraldehyde is flat. And if you attack it, you can make a new chiral center. What's that called? It's flat, and if you attack it, the carbon becomes chiral. What's it called? Prochiral. So that's a prochiral carbonyl. And you can attack from both bases and get two compounds. Now, from a chemical point of view, which is the end of my job here, what, are the, what is the relationship between this molecule on the left and this molecule on the right? Give me a term from the stereochemical chapter a while back to describe that, those two molecules. Diastereomers. Yes, they are diastereomers. They are not enantiomers because some of the stereocenters don't change. You bring in a new one, it goes left or right, you end up with diastereomers. And you can go further with this. You can go up to the more common compounds that you've probably heard of, like ribose, DNA and, or RNA, ribonucleic acid. And you do the same thing. You add chemically an extra piece to make a five-carbon sugar. We'll call those pentoses. And those pentoses now, there can be four of them. So when I started off, I introduced two new chiral centers. From there, I can split those up, and I can introduce two to each side. I can get four new chiral centers. So I get four new sugars, xylose, arabinose, xylose, and lixose. And you go further. You can go up to the D-aldohexoses, which are the ones you're most interested because that's what happens in uh, mammalian biology, is if you split this again by adding up an extra carbon to each of these pieces, you get an extra pair of diastereomers. So you'll find now that rules that you know apply. If you have one chiral center, how many stereoisomers can you have? Two. If you have two stereocenters, how many? Four. It's two to the n. Okay, so at the top I have one stereocenter. 2 to the n is, is 2, right? So therefore I get, uh, sorry, I get 1. Down here I get 2 stereocenters. I get 2 compounds. Down here I get 4, down here I get 8. Now, if you look at the stereocenters at the bottom, 1, 2, 3, 4, there are 4 of them. What's 2 to the 4? 16. I only see 8 right there. What's missing? Where are the other 8? L. And how are they related? How is the L series related to that series? They're enantiomers. They are non-superposal mirror images. They're enantiomers. So we typically draw the D-sugars out because they're the most common ones, but you do get L, like L-fucose and L-ramnose. that are very important in biology. So there are 16 of these things very quickly, and in biochem, you'll have to learn them all. So you can go back to some memorizing, which maybe some people are comfortable with, but it can get frustrating because you're not seeing all the little detail in terms of the chemical reactions which you've been learning here. So don't memorize that yet. Just be familiar with the chemical ideas, the fact that you're building stereocenters, and the fact that we're going in between different series, from one stereocenter up to three, up to four, and that gives us diversity in terms of chemical structures. So some common terms. You do need to know this. These are things that you should know now and you should take with you forever. Even the biochemists, and some of you are interested in things like um, bioengineering, taking cellulose and stuff and turning it into energy, 
These are the types of things that we ought to be happy with. So we've got three different forms of, carb of uh, D-glucose right here. On the left, we've got the alpha, and we've got the right on the, we've got the beta, and in the middle, we've got the straight chain form. They're all independent. You dissolve glucose up in water, you get all of them. On the left, the alpha anima is the molecule that has the hydroxyl pointing away from the group of carbon-5. So in other words, this is pointing down, this is pointing up. That's the alpha anima. In the six-membered rings of the D-sugars, it's fairly easy, because they're all written as this chair form, and that you're going to be able to see that it's always the actual situation pointing down. When you go to the L-series, you've got to be careful, because you can have them pointing up as well. The opposite of that is on the right-hand side, and this is the beta form, in which the OH group is pointing up. And you'll see them both. Alpha isn't necessarily better than beta. We have to be careful here with um, definitions. Now, if we're playing with our phones, we're breaking uh, fir the first directive, aren't we? The first directive of Star Trek. Don't play with our phones. It's rude. Thought we'd realize that after nine months. Anyway, here we go. We have alpha and we have beta, and in between we have the aldo part, the aldohexose part. You can see here the aldehyde. And I'm going to ask you to learn this. How do you get from one to the other? It says here that you can change these things in a process called mutarotation. You can go from alpha to beta. And this is a classic sort of MCAT question that people ask. I can think about breaking this thing off maybe and protonating and losing a leaving group. But this happens in neutral solutions, so maybe that's not going to work. What I need to worry about now is the chemical nature of this bond. I have a hydroxyl on a carbon with an O carbon group attached. You've seen that before. It's called a hemiacetal. We know what acetals are, and on the way to acetals, we made hemiacetals. So carbohydrates can exist in a hemiacetal. And a term that you'll see in the future is reducing sugar. It can be reduced. And this will differentiate between different types of compounds. In the middle here, I have this aldehyde. You can reduce aldehyde. What would you use to reduce an aldehyde? LAH, yeah, it's a good option. Anything milder, not quite as nuclear. Sodium borohydride, yeah, that works as well. So because this is open, this can form the aldehyde, it can be reduced. So you've got to keep in mind that these things are cyclical, but they are able to go into this open chain form. And that's how you go from left to right. So if this thing opens up, we get a carbonyl right here on the left, and this thing breaks open, that gives you this chain form. But then I have this aldehyde at the top, which is flat. If I attack from the top, maybe the OH group goes down. There's the alpha compound. If I attack from underneath, maybe the OH group goes up. There's the other one, the beta compound. And those two things now are said to be animas. It's a different type of stereoisomerism, and it's incredibly important in biochemistry. So thinking about where these things come from, definitions and structures that I want you to be aware of now so that you're not in trouble when you get there to biochem. At the top, I've got the alpha and beta pyranoses. Why are they called pyranoses? Well, the term pyran comes from pyran itself. This is the molecule on the top right. And furan is this thing at the bottom. So that's where the furan comes from in the furanose structure. And we can see now five different forms of glucose. And each of those five different forms of glucose has at least four different places to attach. So all of a sudden, you're looking at 20-odd possible der derivatives from just simply glucose, which makes it very, very, very complicated. So at the bottom here, I've got the structure. You need to be aware of this. You need to be happy with the idea that I can go from this material to either of those two six-membered rings or to either of those two five-membered rings. So let me ask you this. Looking at the counting of that chain down there, which hydroxyl cyclizes to give you the six-membered rings? On which carbon is the hydroxyl that needs to go to form the six-membered ring? Which hydroxyl on this system cyclizes to give these two compounds? One, two, three, four, five, or six? Five. Right? It couldn't be six because that will, um, that will give you a seven-membered ring because you've got to include the O in the cycle. At the bottom here, which one goes to give you the five-membered rings? Four. All right, you'll see a lot of that in the future. Well, chemically, there is a lot to do here, but it's stuff we've already done. And this type of process where we can think about mutarotation going between the alpha and the beta is all based on aldehyde chemistry. And if aldehyde chemistry can be sped up by protonation, so can this. We can think about protonating this stuff and maybe th making things go faster. Uh, so what I've got here is simply the f uh, use of an acid. We protonate the cyclic O, and we protonate that thing to do what? What's the point of protonating oxygen? Better leaving group. So now we can come in and start to make it a leaving group, and we can open that cycle up. 
And that will give you an aldehyde at the bottom, and it will give you the hydroxyl pointing back. And if you turn this, if you took this and stretched it out, that's the Fisher depiction. Rotation around here, what's that about? Well, I need to attack from either side, and this is free to rotate. So if I rotate that, I can set this up for the molecule to be attacked from the top. And that then will give me this, which is the other system, and that then will form the, the beta system. So that anamorization mechanism is nothing more complicated than acetal chemistry that we dealt with later or earlier and needs to be looked at. That is something you should know for next week or the week after. Everybody okay? Mr. Homan. Well, be very careful when you say that. Is it racemic? You do get mixtures of the alpha and the beta, but are they enantiomers? They're not, are they? Okay? They are diastereomers. The alpha and the beta are diastereomers because all the other stereocenters did not change their identity. So they're diastereomers. So no, you'll have an optical rotation. Yes. Here we have a very similar process that leads to one of the most complicated and important linkages in biology. This idea of something called a glycoside. Now a glycoside you know, if you go eat lunch after this, you're, you're just ingesting glycoside. Starch is a glycoside. Go outside and chew on the grass, cellulose is a glycoside, right? You'll find now that breakdown of carbohydrates is important for things like energy release, energy storage, and it's all based on this type of chemistry. This is a chemical picture. You will see in biology, this is all about enzymes. In, in enzymes, you're looking at molecules that are huge. In organic chemistry, we deal with H+. You go from H+, which everybody's happy with, to a molecule that has a million molecular weight, that's a, that's a different system, but it serves as H+. What I have here is a fairly simple picture. What did I need to do to get to here? This is called the glycosyl cation. That's a very important idea in medicinal chemistry, being able to mimic that thing. What's happened here in this first step? You've protonated something. Now, I can protonate wherever. I'm protonating on this particular hydroxyl at carbon-1 because when it breaks off, it gives a carbocation that can be resonant stabilized. Make a note of that. The chemistry here is only happening at carbon-1 because that is where you can get the best carbocation. You can form a resonance stabilized system, which is better than any of the other possibilities in that molecule. And if you think about where these two molecules come from, one is the beta isomer at the top, one is the alpha isomer at the bottom. Where do they come from? What can I say about this carbocation? Give me a word that describes it. I'm getting two products, one of which is up, one of which is down, so what's the deal with the intermediate? Prochiral. That carbocation is prochiral. You will see a lot of that in the future. Now, a definition again, which you might have heard previously, but I'll do it again. This no longer mutarotates. Glycosides don't mutarotate. So glycosides don't open up to aldehydes. If glycosides don't op open up to aldehydes, they cannot be reduced. So these are said to be non-reducing sugars. You can't get the aldehyde, you can't get reduction. Aldehyde, yes, for the hemiacetal. This is now a full acetal. You're not going to get reduction. Where's the, where's the full acetal? Oxygen in the cycle, OCH3. That's an acetal at the top right there. And what do you know about acetals? What do they react with? Do they react with acid or, or base? They react with acid. They don't react with base. That's why we use them as protecting groups. But they react with acid and you can go backwards. And that's the whole point of sort of ingestion of carbohydrates so that you can break these things down. Starting in your mouth with saliv salivary amylase, acid catalyzed breakdown of some of the carbohydrate gets to your stomach more acid, acid catalyzed breakdown of carbohydrates gets to your gut, more glucosidases which do this, and the whole sort of progression of breaking down food material into stuff we can absorb and use based on this idea. So complicated systems that you will see in the near future, uh, disaccharides, trisaccharides, polysaccharides, glucose is a monosaccharide, lactose in milk is a disaccharide. You go to starch and stuff like that, they are polysaccharides. But the problem is, this, is the information transfer. Okay? Biology is all about information transfer, but also reading this stuff is the same thing. And you have to have different pictures to be able to, trans to, be able to uh, converse with this stuff. And you've seen at least two of these pictures before. You've seen the one in the middle. We spent all that time on chairs a while back. And you've seen this stuff on the right when we put wedges and dashes in there. Those of you who are going into anything biologically related are going to have to be conversant with those pictures again to understand that straight away that's glucose, or straight away that's mannose, or immediately that's lactose. And that's tricky. There's an awful lot of things to learn there. We have different ways of doing this. We can call, use something called a Howarth projection. Howarth projection was put together to get rid of some of the noise and to make it obvious very quickly to who's reading this stuff, the relative orientation of each group. 
So we can see now, the hydroxyl group at carbon-4 here on the left is pointing down. That's maybe not so easy to see in the chair form. So the Howell project, pro projection is very useful because it's very clear to see that these two are trans, these two are cis. Very, very clever way of doing it. And why is this important? Well, if you turn this hydroxyl up and you make it in the axial position, you get a completely different molecule with completely different biological properties. On the right, stereo depictions, wedges and dashes, important. Again, you've got to be okay with those things to remember what they look like. But the point at the bottom is, these are now made up of acetals. You have joined carbohydrate to carbohydrate through an acetal, and you have a more complex system. Your problem in the future will be things like, I have 25 different ways of doing this. Which one happens? That's the, that's the job. Other examples, things that you may have heard of at the top, maltose. What do you find maltose? Hops or something, or beer, when you're making beer from that. Celebios, simple disaccharide from grass. On the top right, lactose. What do you find lactose? Milk. And people who are lactose intolerant, it's this complication here. This is axial. You bring this down here, it becomes equatorial. All of a sudden, you can deal with it. So one stereocenter difference in that molecule makes all the problems. Digitoxin, heard that before? Cardiac glycosides, okay? These things are, uh, have lots of activity in terms of heart uh, biochemistry. And you can see now quite complex, but at the bottom left, carbohydrate. And that carbohydrate is important for the recognition of that molecule. And then this stuff at the bottom, I think you'll see quite a bit of. Cholesterol obviously is important. It's a lipid, I'll show you that in a minute. But if you want to get rid of nonpolar molecules from the body, if you ingest something that's nonpolar, or you simply want to get rid of it for some meta metabolic process, those things typically aren't soluble in water. They usually find their way to lipid membranes because they're nonpolar and that's where they're happy. So how do you make it more soluble? You attach it to something soluble. So in this case, a lot of the, 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 uh, a lot of the way we get rid of material from the body, especially through urination, is to actually conjugate this molecule to carbohydrate, in particular glucuronic acid. And that gives you a very polar material which then can be eliminated. So carbohydrate chemistry, again, has got all sorts of biological function. I'm going to ask you about this. This is where I'm going in the question I've asked in the past. I'm going to show you systems you haven't seen before. Can you deal with it? I'm going to show you something that is chemistry you've seen, but it's in a system you're not familiar with. On the left, I have a disaccharide. Two glucose units joined together. It's a 1,4 disaccharide. Dilute sulfuric acid breaks this apart into two carbohydrates. What's the first thing you would do in acid? Protonate something. The problem now is you have many different places to protonate. I can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 different places to protonate. Now we can go back into the organic chemistry, which is nice and tame and nothing complicated, where you had one or two places to protonate. Or we can go into biology, in which you can protonate everywhere. Where do we want to go? Biology, we have to. Where is the place to protonate in this system? Where's the logical place to protonate to make something good happen? In the middle. In the middle. If you protonate here, you can break this thing off and you can form a stabilized carbocation. That only can happen at the one position because you've got the oxygen in the cycle to help you do that. If that's the case, then water comes in and traps that cation and you get two molecules of that product. Why am I showing a squiggle? What's that trying to tell? Up or down? Yeah? Equatorial or axial? You get both. It's not racemic because they're not enantiomers. But mechanistically, there it is. That is now an organic chemical reaction applied to a biological molecule, which could argue to be biochemistry. And as you head into biochem, remember that. It's just what, organic chemistry and water. That's all it is. So protonate something, lose something, trap something, resonance to help stabilize. The same ideas again and again. And you should be okay with that. There's the idea of the two the squiggles, where we're at, attacking at both positions here, and that gives us two molecules of the same thing. Molecules aren't necessarily more complicated, they're just bigger. Your job is to dig out where things happen. Everybody okay? It's getting busy, isn't it? Last two weeks of term. It's always busy. That's just unfortunately the way it is. Well, this is FYI. This is now stepping over that line into the realm of biochemistry and biology, in which I don't see any atoms necessarily. I see a molecular model. And what I see is one of the roles of carbohydrates in biology, which is something called molecular recognition, where a protein comes along and there's a big ch choice of things to pick from, and it picks one specifically. You get specificity, all based on carbohydrate function and structure. 
all based on whether things are axial or equatorial. So these functional groups now, these hydroxyl groups in this molecule, these hydroxyl groups in this amino acid sequence are all matched so that you can go in fishing into a pool of different carbohydrates and the protein picks out only one because it has the correct three-dimensional structure and the other ones don't. So you'll see now that carbohydrates become incredibly important in things like cell adhesion, uh, antibody recognition, viral and bacterial addition, or adhesion because of these complex carbohydrates which have specific patterns that only match one type of receptor. And at the bottom, I think the argument goes that carbohydrate chemistry is so complicated because two amino acids can come together in different ways, AA, BB, AB, BA, that's it. Whereas hexoses, like the ones we just saw, can give you 20 possible compounds. It's a much more complicated alphabet. Now, again, we're verging into the biology because all of a sudden we get Pac-Man. Okay, we get the cartoon stuff. And this is how you have to do it. This is a frustrating thing for people who like the detail because that just looks like a, a video game. Yeah? Uh, Pac-Man is coming along, grabbing hold of a molecule of maltose and then digesting it and then releasing two molecules of glucose. This is a huge molecule. In fact, there's a picture of one of them, alpha-glucosidase. Maybe salivary amylase that everybody secretes. The formula weight of this is huge. It's usually thousands. Whereas we're used to, in organic chemistry, a, a species that has a molecular weight or an atomic weight of one. I'd rather be over here, honestly. Right? That one is, is fun. That H plus is fun. But that's what serves as H plus in biology. You will find that this is all very complicated and all very elegant, but all it's doing is serving as H plus. Remember that as you go forward. You'll see the storage of carbohydrates and the breakdown of carbohydrates becomes very, very useful and very, very important for uh, all sorts of different processes and diseases like diabetes. Uh, being able to do these types of things is important. Being able to modulate those things is very important. Uh, so again, carbohydrates get more complicated as you put them together, but it's still simple organic chemistry. Now I've got a story to finish off with. I've got maybe two or three slides and then I'll break and then we'll do um, nucleic acids on Wednesday. And this is just the application of some of these ideas in bigger subjects. Some people are starting to think, well, I like this stuff. Maybe instead of going to work in a pharmacy, I want to go work in a pharmaceutical company and actually make the medicine as opposed to sell it or hand it to somebody. And this is where this starts, the application of organic ideas to medicinal chemistry. So we can see here the sort of broken down schematic for a hydrolysis, a carbohydrate hydrolysis. It's a whole bunch of information on there, but look at this. In this first reaction, a base is coming off taking a proton, which is making this hydroxyl more nucleophilic, which is then allowing this thing to come off. What does that remind you of? Nucleophile coming in, leaving group coming out. What does that remind you of? SN2. Look at the outcome there. What's the, what's the outcome? It's inversion. You started out with the alpha over here, you've got the beta over here. That's an inversion. That's an inverting enzyme. In the next step, or in the next argument here, we have an enzyme coming in, attacking this thing. This is leaving as a leaving group by being protonated. And that looks like an inversion in the first step. But then a nucleophile comes in from underneath, and that looks like a retention. How do you get retention? SN2, SN2. Invert, invert back. That's what biology does. Sequential SN2s. So with that in mind, think about some of the possibilities here, some of the ideas that you know. If you form a carbocation, what shape is it roughly? Flat. If you do an SN2 reaction, what was the shape of the transition state? Planar, wasn't it? Right? Trigon, bi was it trigonal bipyramidal? It's a planar idea. So you can use those ideas to mimic and to build compounds that have similar structures to those intermediates or transition states, which then might interact with the enzyme instead of the natural substrate, slow it down, and act as a, a medicine or a pharmaceutical. And that's exactly what these compounds do here. These are inhibitors of this type of glucosidase. They are compounds that have structures very similar. See here, there's an NH instead of an O. That compound binds to the, binds to the protein, and it slows the next chemistry down. It stops the protein from picking up the right substrate, and therefore uh, inhibits it. Well, the story is simply uh, influenza and this idea of Tamiflu and Relenza, these compounds that were developed in the past 10, 15 years to help alleviate the symptoms of flu. And these were great drugs because they had lots of promise, but all of a sudden, you know, what do, what do viruses do that you don't like? They mutate. They get clever. They, you know, they, they just laugh at your pharmaceutical and go elsewhere. And that's the problem. You become immune to these things. They become resistant. So we have up here... Uh, the Death Star, whatever this thing is, um, and it's, a, it's an influenza virus. And when it invades your cells and starts to replicate, 
it kind of anchors itself to the cell through a carbohydrate linkage. And that carbohydrate linkage happens to be an acetal. And if you think about how this thing then releases itself, it has to hydrolyze that acetal. It simply has to bring in H+, clip off that acetal, and the progeny are then free to go off and do their business to infect other cells. Well, how do you stop that from happening? You build a compound that prevents that from snapping off. And that's exactly what this story was. At the top, we have uh, the carbohydrate that's used in this material to actually link together. And we have its transition state in the hydrolysis process. An organic chemist, medicinal chemist, took that as a, a clue and as a guide to build these mimics. They look like transition state mimics. And they worked for a long time. And the government spent millions on stockpiling these things. And then everybody got resistance. And it's kind of ugly. But you can see now this is a real process where you can mimic a biological process and build an organic compound to then go after that biological process. So what I have at the bottom are biochemical type ideas, biophysical type ideas. If you're into mathematics, look at biophysics. Look at the idea of molecular modeling and looking at molecular structure. Huge area. At the bottom right, we have probably a, a crystal structure in terms of what the transition state looks like, what the molecules look like as they're reacting, stuff like that. So those are huge fields which are uh, becoming very, very important in chemistry. And I want, to draw, I want to show the picture of the rat. Is it a rat or a mouse, you biology people? It looks like a big, ugly rat, doesn't it? Yeah. This is now a new area that's been pioneered by Carolyn Batozzi. And if she doesn't win a Nobel Prize before she's done, that's, that's a travesty. Uh, about my age, has been at Berkeley for most of her career, just moved to Stanford, uh, won a Genius Award four years ago. Uh, which is a grant to just unlimited funds and says, here, go spend it on doing science. And her stuff will make it into the clinic at some point. What she does is, is cell engineering. And cell engineering involves building organic molecules and having them metabolize so they show up in the body. And they show up as part of body structures. They show up as part of cells. And she's been able to take these simple types of compounds and allow them, feed them through metabolic labeling so that they do show up on the cell surface. But they have functional groups on the cell surface which we don't recognize. There are no azides in our body. There are no azides in biochemistry. Well, it turns out you can do all sorts of chemistry like a diels alder reaction, like a cycloaddition with these molecules in the cell or on the cell surface, and you can tag. You can put fluorescent dyes. I'll, I'll just show you this last picture here. The biologists are, are familiar with these things. You use dyes to see where things are. Well, how do you get your dye to the right place? Now you have a delivery system. You have molecules like this which can tag along make it all the way through a metabolic process, make it to the cell surface, and then boom, you do biochemistry, organic chemistry. And you tag these things with fluorescent dyes, and then they show up. Okay? And all of a sudden, you've got a very precise way of saying the cell, recept cell receptor I'm after is here, or here, or here. And that's sort of state-of-the-art stuff that uh, I would imagine in the near future will be um, uh, commercialized, and certainly, hopefully, will win a Nobel Prize. Now, I'm done there. I'm going to stop there for recitation.